Hello and welcome to the Spectators Alternative Conference. Our latest event is the Pathway to Net Zero. How has COVID-19 impacted the UK's pledge to reduce carbon emissions? Uh, this event very kindly sponsored by Scottish Power. And uh, we, have, we might not be in Birmingham, but we do have an absolutely fantastic panel where for you to discuss this question with. We have Kwasi Kwaseng, who is the Minister of State at the Department of Business, uh, Energy and Industrial Strategy and is in charge of clean growth there. We have Baroness Brown of Cambridge. She's the Vice Chair of the UK Committee on Climate Change and Chair of the Carbon Trust. We have James Diggle, who's Head of Energy and Climate Change at the CBI, and Keith Anderson, who is the Chief Executive Officer for Scottish Power. Now, one of the uh, effects of COVID-19 is that it massively reduced the UK's carbon emissions during the lockdown. But that cut is obviously only a temporary measure. And uh, the UK, along, alongside nearly every other country, is not currently on course to hit net zero by 2050. Uh, but the UK is hosting next year uh, COP26 in Glasgow. And this is going to be one of the major diplomatic events for post-Brexit Britain. And the question comes whether the UK can show uh, that it is going to um, lead the way in global terms in getting to net zero. And how to do that is the question we're going to be discussing today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask all the speakers to speak for two minutes or so, a couple of minutes at the beginning, and then we'll throw, but we'll have some panel discussion and then we'll throw it open to your questions. Um, Kwasi, I was wondering if you wanted to start us off with a few minutes on what the government is doing to net zero and how it's going to get there. We're doing a great deal, and I just, uh, I just want to say uh, that we should really remember where we've come from. Um, as far as decarbonisation is concerned, that's something that's been going on uh, for more than 30 years now. If you look at where we were in 1990 and look at where we are now, we've managed to grow the economy by 75 percent, while reducing carbon emissions by 43 uh, percent. So it is possible to decarbonise an economy and grow it at the same time, and that's really at the centre of what we're trying to do. In terms of specifics that we're doing ahead of COP26, uh, we've got an energy white paper coming out, which I know the industry is eagerly awaiting. We've got a hydrogen strategy, which will, um, I think, be a world leading uh, document in terms of how we can harness hydrogen uh, for a greener economy. We've got, we're looking at heat and buildings and how we can improve uh, the insulation of uh, buildings and as, uh, as well as decarbonizing uh, heat sources through heat pumps and possibly also through the use of hydrogen uh, in the future in, in the grid system. Um, we are committed, we've already committed, I think, £3 billion uh, this summer to uh, various schemes which will decarbonise uh, buildings. The Green Homes Grant is £2 billion, which is being rolled out this month. So there are a whole range of things that we're doing uh, across a range of technologies, um, which I think will help us uh, power our way to net zero. Now, there's still a lot more uh, to be done. And as you've said, um, we're slightly off the uh, carbon budget period four and f more considerably off five. Uh, so there's more work to be done. But uh, I think there's plenty to be getting on with. And we are definitely um, rolling out policies that will help us get there. Uh, Baroness Brown, what, what grades would you give the government's efforts to hit net zero by 2050? Um, I think um, Kwasi has has already said that, yes, you know, we're hearing the right noises, some of the right announcements have been made, but we really have to get on and do it and accelerate the pace. Uh, and I think it's, it's good to reflect um, as we think about what we're going to do um, to, to build our way out of, out of the um, uh, COVID crisis. It's, it's good to reflect on, for example, the success of, of renewable energy spending. I mean, if you look at the Ersted share price compared to the BP share price trajectory, even before the pandemic, um, Ersted were shooting up and BP had, had flattened off. Um, global renewable energy spending is set to surpass oil and gas in 2021. And I think once we get there, there's really going to be an amazing acceleration. And it creates three times as many jobs per pound spent um, in renewables as we do in fossil fuels. So that really says that's the kind of thing that it's going to be very important for us to be doing um, more of. And as Quasi has flagged up, that the key areas in the UK for immediate investment 
which can support jobs and leveling up are exactly things like the building retrofit that he has talked about, the energy efficiency, the low carbon heat, um, the adapting to homes for the high temperatures we're going to see in the summer. But also we could be accelerating our, our flood protection program. We could be accelerating our nature-based solutions program with tree planting and nature restoration. We could be accelerating our low carbon vehicle infrastructure. These are all things we can get onto very quickly, that create jobs all over the place and will really help with the, uh, the leveling up agenda. And I think as Kwasi has touched on too, so I'm you know, very much in line with him, but just I think want him to be able to move even faster. Um, there are really key areas for net zero, which are also key areas for the UK's competitive future and which bu really build on our strengths. So renewable energy like offshore wind, but as Kwasi has mentioned, hydrogen, which really draws on capabilities and, and companies already in the UK with fantastic opportunities for growth and, and carbon capture and storage and things like that. So, you know, I think we're, we're well positioned, I think. We do really need to see the government take the opportunity of um, the opportunity of, of low interest rates uh, and indeed the, the interest of international investors to help us drive these things really, really rapidly now. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Baroness Brown. Uh, Keith Anderson, you're the CEO of a, of a power company. From the perspective of industry, how do you think things are going? How well do you think the UK is handling all of this? I, well, I, I think there's a, a brilliant opportunity. So I think the, the great thing is that um, you know, what we're hearing from lots of stakeholders, uh, politicians, from the government, from everyone, it just seems to be a really good general agreement that uh, you know, a great source of economic recovery uh, is to do it as a green recovery. And therefore, an awful lot of the focus on life now about not just about should we do 2050, is 2050 difficult, you know, most of the conversation now is about how can we accelerate, how can we do more, how can we do it faster? And I think the great thing is it's bringing together lots of good positive elements where most people accept a great way to do an economic recovery in the back of a crisis is through investment, through investment in infrastructure, uh, because it's big investment. Infrastructure tends to be labor intensive, so you create the jobs, you create training opportunities, apprenticeship opportunities, and then if you make that infrastructure related to uh, greening and decarbonizing. So whether that's in the, the energy infrastructure, the transmission system, the distribution system, whether it's directly in uh, the decarbonization of transport or the heating system, uh, et cetera, what you're doing is you're ticking all the right boxes. You're accelerating 2050, you're creating jobs, you're creating supply chain contracts, you're creating manufacturing, and you're creating an economic recovery. Uh, and you're, you're getting yourself to 2050. So lots of great things lined up. I suppose you know, from a business point of view, um, we then want to translate that into hard-nosed practical steps. So we issued our 10-point practical step plan as to how you do this in and around areas like acceleration of renewables, offshore wind, solar, onshore wind, acceleration of transport investment, uh, so the rollout of EV infrastructure, and then the creation of a heat market and the rollout of heat. Because... Our view is all of those things will create jobs very, very quickly. Uh, all of those things will create uh, supply chain contracts and lots and lots of investment very, very quickly. So those are the things we would like to see being triggered uh, pretty much immediately, uh, and, and they can go now. The other great thing is they're all existing technologies. We're not trying to invent something new to do that and to deliver it. And that's where we came up with, our, came up with the, the, the kind of simple methodology of you know, use the next 10 to 15 years and electrify the hell out of everything with your existing technology and use that to buy you the time to go and test and prove what we can and can't do with hydrogen, how hydrogen can help, where hydrogen, where hydrogen can help, look at technologies like CCS and other things as well, because we'll need all of those tools in the box at the later stage. But don't slow, don't slow down, don't wait, push ahead, and deliver it now, and you'll, you'll get yourself on that path to 2050, and you'll create jobs in the meantime. Brilliant as well that we've got COP26 coming to the UK, coming to Glasgow next year. That gives us a really, really good boost to focus attention and to focus delivery in and around that COP coming, so we can show what steps we've made. We can demonstrate the innovation in the UK. We can demonstrate the new technology in the UK. 
and we can show the rest of the world, here's how you do this, here's how you drive this. And the, the last thing I'll say is speed. The faster we go, the better, because every country in the world is going to look to do exactly what we're looking to do. They'll all be chasing the same money, the same capital, the same technology, the same innovation. So the faster we move, the better it is for the country, the better it is for the economy, and the better it is for the future. That's me. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, James, from the perspective of uh, business more broadly, um, is there a, you know, how comfortable are firms with, the, with, trying to, with the, the changes that will be necessary if we are going to get to net zero by 2050? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the, the, the interesting thing with the, the net zero target is from the perspective of the CBI, how sort of broadly it's been been taken on board and actually how, you know, when we look across sectors, it's really triggering a, a new type of thinking, you know, whether it's, you know, the, the energy sector we, we just heard about, but you know, across all different uh, types of, of, of firms across the economy, you know, people are sort of stepping up to this challenge and, you know, the, the development of corporate net zero targets. And every, every week, you know, we seem to see, you know, a new set of targets set, um, you know, and, and, and that's hugely exciting. So I think that that, that, that buy-in is there. You know, obviously the, the pandemic is, is, is still causing hu huge issues and, and, and some parts of the economy are hit harder uh, than others. So I think, you know, we always have to think about, you know, how, how, how we could have get through the, you know, the upcoming weeks and months. And, and that's still the kind of the, the time horizon that, that many businesses are looking at. But I don't think it's dampening the expectations about what we need to achieve on the climate, um, and you know, we, we've heard about you know all the all the, all the things coming up from, from from government, which are you know which are exciting, but they you know it's clearly a moment to to pivot. It's a it's a moment to to change to something better. And, you know, we have this opportunity. We have the deadline of, of COP26 as well. Um, and I think you know from my position, I hear so many of our of our members again from across sectors saying, you know, what does what does COP26 mean? What can we do to take part? You know, how can we do our bit to deliver emissions reduction? So even though we, you know, we're still going through um, the, the depths of a crisis, you know, the, the longer term vision of what we need to achieve, I think, is, is, really, is really there. And, and you know, it's, it's why you know, across uh, the last few months, the CBI has written two policy papers and done a conference already on, 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 the, on the idea of, of the green recovery and, and the need to get net zero. So that, that business backing is really there. Brilliant. James, thank you so much. Um, quasi, if I may. Uh, it, when you look at this, the, the obvious political question right now is, is the government is it going to embrace a kind of green Keynesianism, which you can see as a kind of popular uh, response, kind of economic growth driving response to this pandemic and the recession and the economic damage that is bound to follow. But I think the more difficult issue, is it not, is when it comes down to trying to change consumer behaviour in ways that people aren't necessarily happy with. For example, you know, no more um, hybrids or petrol or diesel cars to be sold after 2030. Um, you represent a kind of suburban, southern English constituency. How much public appetite do you think there is for the changes that will be necessary? To I think there's considerably the more than was the case uh, when I was first elected in 2010. I can assure you about that. Um, and I was noting that um, last uh, December was the fifth general election in which I've been a candidate. So over 15 years, I've been a general uh, election candidate in five of those elections. And this was the first time in 2019 that the issue of global warming, of climate change, of carbon reductions actually came up on the doorstep. I mean, not all the time, but it was spontaneously referred to in a way that I can't remember it. Uh, having been referred to before. So I think that's a huge uh, step in the right direction. It was interesting in your question, you mentioned the fact that we're going to uh, push forward uh, the, um, the rollout of EVs or the um, withdrawal of uh, petrol and diesel cars. Uh, and that actually answers your question. The fact that we can move this forward suggests that there is actually more appetite than we anticipated. At the beginning, only a year ago or 18 months ago, we were talking about 2040. And now we're talking about 2035, 2032, people are even suggesting 2030. So the fact that that number, rather that year, that date has been brought forward as quickly as it has been, suggests to me that there is actually a lot more appetite out there for the kind of changes uh, that you've described. Now, that doesn't mean that we still don't have a problem in terms of bringing larger numbers over uh, uh, and persuading them. But I think that the, the, the current has definitely, the currents have definitely shifted over the last five or 10 years. And I think this is something which all the major parties 
um, are, are, are agreeing about. Nobody's saying, oh, this is going to be too fast. Uh, we are not carrying people with us. Uh, you know, nobody, nobody's saying that. Uh, Baroness Brown, do, do you think there is a case um, after Brexit for, for the UK to introduce its own carbon tax? Um, well, of course, we, we effectively do have quite a few embedded carbon taxes already, but I, 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 I've never quite understood why governments weren't more enthusiastic about carbon taxes, you know, uh, a new way to, to raise rem rem revenue and also to do good at the same time. And, and I, I know I'd, I'd actually like to see us thinking about bringing a carbon tax back on fuel, because I think it would help um, move us towards people understanding the lower costs of uh, running, uh, buying and running electric vehicles. So I think it would be very good to be seeing a, a much stronger debate about a UK carbon tax, yes. Kwasi, are, are you up for a carbon tax? Are you a pigovian? Well, no, I'm not, I'm not um, a big carbon tax fan. I mean, I think it, it has its uses and merits. But on balance, I'd much rather have uh, ETS, which is the, or the UK uh, ETS, which is an emission, uh, tra uh, emission um, transaction sort of credit uh, system. So, and, the, and the benefit of that is that it actually limits the amount of emissions that you can have in the system. Whereas all a carbon tax does is disincentivize uh, bad behavior. Now, if people want to uh, emit carbon, they, all they have to do is pay a tax and they can do so merrily. And I don't think the carbon tax is necessarily the best instrument if your you know, sole purpose is to reduce, or your principal purpose is to reduce the actual level of carbon emissions. Uh, Keith, you talked about um, kind of electrifying the hell out of everything while you looked into kind of other alternative solutions such as hydrogen. Um, on, on that point, one thing you hear from people, which is, you know, but the electricity network as you get out into kind of rural Britain, you know, isn't powerful enough to, to, to quickly to, to charge electric vehicles fast enough. Do you think that's a valid criticism? Oh, look, so we, you know, I think you know, this relates to the previous question as well, the, the, this answer, which is, look, the, the trick to doing all of this and, and to creating, to creating this conversion and engaging people is we need to make this really, really easy for people and we need to make it really, really obvious so that when somebody walks through or gets to the decision point or walks through the door, whether it's for a car or a new heating system, that actually we're not having to at that point in time convince them about the merits of an electric car, but that point in time, actually, why wouldn't you buy an electric car? Yeah, so we need to make it that simple, that straightforward and that obvious. And the same with heating, that actually people will think, you know what, the obvious choice is an electric heat pump, okay? So we need to therefore drive down the cost, um, get the innovation coming through. So these choices become obvious, simple, easy choices for people to make as and when the time to switch these products and these processes. And it's the same for industrial processes. So, you know, this whole idea about hydrogen to me is, I, I think, you know, isn't so much about your, your um, pu public cars or public transport. It's, you know, this is about, you know, big industrial processes and maybe big industrial machinery and big industrial vehicles. Um, and again, we need to get to use the time to push that hydrogen, invest in it in its early stage, then look how the innovation can drive down the cost and we can take it to market. And again, therefore, it becomes easier and simpler for businesses to make that switch. So when they're looking at the reinvestment in the manufacturing and production processes, you know, if it's hydrogen to the, the right answer or if it's electricity, that what we then do is we're making it easy, simple and obvious folk to make the switch. And that's really where you need to get to. You know, it was, it's, you know, that, that's been the great success of offshore renewables is it's been the obvious choice. We created the right market, we created the right framework, we got the right level of innovation, we drove down the cost, and now everybody knows offshore wind's cheap. Okay, and we need to do the same on transport, we need to do the same with heat, we need to do the same with industrial processes, that we get to this point where actually it's cost competitive, and therefore there's no, you know, the barriers start getting removed. Now, that's a two stage. Some of that for, for market ready technology, create the right framework and it will come through. For technology that's not market ready, that's where we need the government to sit and help as well. And we look at how do we get the right investment in the prototypes? How do we get the R&D through? 
how do we get it to a point where we can get it to be market ready and we can flip it into a market mechanism. That way you avoid having to rely on huge amounts of government spending and government support. You deliver it through private capital and private investment, a mixture of good regulatory frameworks and good market frameworks, like the real framework for, for networks and distribution, and like the CFD framework for renewables. That drives the investment. So yes, the, the, the background infrastructure is critical. The worst thing in the world you can do is, infuse, is drive down the cost of an electric car, infuse somebody to, to, to want to buy an electric car, and then they get told they can't charge it. So we need to make sure the background infrastructure is constantly being invested so that doesn't become a barrier and it doesn't become a blockage. And so the faster we do that as well, the better. Other great thing about doing that, if you invest like hell in that infrastructure now, you will create jobs, you'll create supply chain contracts, you'll complete, com uh, and trigger an economic recovery. So we should push ahead with it, yeah. James, from a business point of view, do you think business has the certainty that it needs to make these investment decisions? Um, you know, for example, I think if you were a business that had moved to a kind of hybrid fleet of cars, you might be rather irritated to find the government suddenly changing its position on hybrid vehicles. You know, you had Gordon Brown encouraging people to move to diesel only for diesel now to be regarded as a problem rather than a solution. Um, do you think that is the, the business have a confidence in in governments of all stripes really to, to make these long-term decisions yeah i mean you, you you identify a really important point which is the need for that that certainty because you know the investment cycles that, that business work on a multi-year they go beyond governments and, and parliaments and you know we, we need that that certainty and you know we want to come back to the you know the, the the question around you know how do we make the uk the best place to to invest i think you know the you know the you know leaving the eu as well it gives us a moment to sort of think about that again you know what what is going to be you know the, the uk's kind of selling point so i think really kind of long-term thinking in our policy frameworks and, and our regulatory frameworks as well as uh, as Keith mentioned there so I think it's it's really important you know I think um, you know, we've, we've discussed already sort of the, the multiple um, strategies uh, and policy documents that are due from government in in the coming months and they're going to be so vital for kind of setting out that that long-term tra trajectory um, and I think it, it the, the, I guess there will be call from business would be to really kind of focus on the idea of sector roadmaps um, because you know we have a number of, of hard to decarbonize sectors that we need to think about you know we, we discussed transport and Keith mentioned heavy industry and uh, you know how we kind of de develop our long-term kind of manufacturing and, and, and industrial policy I think is, is, is really critical there and, and it's those in cycles investment cycles in particular where we need those um, those really long-term signals uh, from uh, from a policy perspective and a regulatory perspective and key to all of this is that it you know it's joined up across government you know, I think um, in recent advice from the committee on, uh, on climate change um, we saw kind of a, a list of, of, of requests to different government departments and it really kind of shows how uh, cross government to challenge this is and it really needs to be linked up sort of from from the top and it's you know great to sort of see that the prime minister you know kind of speaking you know um, last week to, to the UN sort of with, with his vision and I think we just we really need to build on that and have that kind of really kind of sort of central idea of, of how we're going to knit all this together. Uh, Baroness Brown, the, 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 the view in Westminster seems to be that, that hitting the aim of decarbonising the electricity grid by 2030 it is quite doable. But it, it's that, that last stage, particularly about homes and heating, that is going to be the most difficult thing for the UK to manage to achieve, you know, replacing every boiler in the land and the like. What, what do you think the best answer is there? Uh, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, they, the electricity system is the relatively easy bit, but we shouldn't forget that actually by, uh, um, by 2050, if we're going to, as Keith has said, um, use so much more electricity because of so many areas of life we're going to electrify, we not only have to decarbonize it, but we probably have to somewhere between double and treble it in size. So the speed and scale of growing the new low carbon electricity system is also challenging and something we need to be driving forward now. But as you say, um, decarbonizing our homes uh, is probably one of the most challenging areas, um, partly because there is um, such a diversity of ownership of our homes, uh, a large proportion of rented homes, a large proportion of owner-occupiers, a large proportion of owner-occupiers who've already um, paid for their homes, sort of older people who no longer have a mortgage, so you can't necessarily tempt them by um, a very low 
potentially a very low green addition to their mortgage to make the changes that are needed. So we really do, I think, have to segment our support to thinking about, um, uh, you know, to thinking about the rented sector. Can we do that with levers that say landlords need, you know, can only rent out properties at a at a given level of uh, of efficiency or at a later date um, if they have zero carbon heating. Um, you know, we, we may be, um, council homes are probably um, a, a rather easier sector, but then we've got to think about how do we incentivize the owner occupier. And as Kwasi has said, actually, um, the new um, green home energy grant scheme that's just, just about to be launched this week, isn't it Kwasi? Um, I think is, is a pretty good incentive that will start to move the owner occupier, um, uh, the owner occupier um, group. And we, we really do need to see how that progresses and how we can accelerate that. I, I, and one more question, Baroness, if I may. What, what, what is your sense on carbon capture and storage? This seems to be a thing that divides a lot of opinion. Some people say, oh, it, it's not really green if it requires carbon capture and storage. Other people argue that there's no way you're going to get to net zero by 2050 without carbon capture and storage. Um, I think carbon capture and storage is going to be essential. I think um, you know, it may even give us the opportunity to provide negative CO2 emissions by using bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. Uh, I hope we won't do more of it than, than is absolutely necessary because it, in some ways it is storing a problem for future generations, you know, um, just as storing nuclear waste is some, to some extent leaving an issue for future generations. But we are going to need to do it. So it's an, extent, an essential technology for us to get on and develop. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Keith, if I may, what do you think the consumer appetite for um, uh, the greenery is. Do you notice your customers are choosing to pick uh, renewable tariffs? You know, it, are they are they making those? Are they making decisions on switching and which particular tariff to choose based on how green it is? I think we'll, I think c consumer engagement's getting better and better all the time. Um, you know, and uh, you know there are a couple of things in and around the market that you can look at to say that. I mean, if you look at the level of engagement. You know, in the in the climate forums that, that were created uh, recently, you know, and people were really, really, really keen to get involved and, and to dedicate a lot of time to it. And that shows you there's a big appetite to be involved in this and think about it. You know, I quote you nice, simple examples. Like we've got, a, you know, I could look at my window here and we've got a huge big wind farm in the outskirts of Glasgow and we get 100,000 people a year coming to visit a wind farm. I mean, that's kind of slightly bonkers. Yeah, but it shows you pe people want to be involved in this, they want to understand it, they want, they want to be a part of it. So I think generally there's, there's good public engagement, you know, and, and it's been increasing, increasing, increasing all the time. But we need to, as I said earlier, what we need to do is we need to get to the point where people think it's an easy choice as well. You know, we can't force them into this. And if we make this difficult, then it will put people off. So we, we need to get the costs right. We need to get the investment right. We need to get the choices right. The, the, the heating conversation and, and you know, the points that were made by Julie, are, are, you know, I don't disagree with any of them, but th there's another one where you know, to kickstart the market, you know, why don't we start with new build? Okay, and, you know, and therefore any new build home as of X date you know, ha has to be getting built with uh, renewable heat. Okay, and you start the market and you grow the market, you incentivize companies to invest in the technology, you start to drive down the cost of the technology. You can then look at retrofit, and you need to remember: you know, every year in this every year in this country, there are thousands of boilers replaced year on year. You know, whether it's ten years old or fifty years old, we go through a boiler replacement program. So it's not as if we have to force bits of the market. We can do it. There are there are difficult bits of the market that are hard to reach bits of the market. There are challenges in the market around buy to let, etc. But we don't need all the answers immediately to start. So we need to start now and start with the easy bits and start to create the market and start to create the investment and start to create the technology wave because that's what will drive down the cost. And then that will help us find the answers to the more difficult solutions and the more difficult bits of the market. And that's the same with technology, whether it's carbon capture and storage or hydrogen. Start now and we'll start working out the answers and we'll find the answers and then we'll deliver the technology in the future. And we need to just keep doing it. The, the concern I always have is if we focus on the problems, we'll just never do anything. So find the easy bits to start. You're on mute. 
uh, myself. Um, Quasi, how about it? How about only new, all new builds having to have hydrogen ready boilers in them? I think we've tr- we've done a lot actually in, in improving the standards of uh, new build housing. And actually, in the, the people I speak to in the sector, and obviously this is a, a an MHCLG, a local government um, department issue as well. Um, are the house builders are very interested actually, much more so than they have been recently in uh, coming up with new measures which will be uh, much more uh, net zero friendly, which will be much more decarbonization friendly than was the case three years ago. I mean, I've mentioned um, hydrogen boilers in conversations. This is something that we're going to be looking at. And we've already uh, brought or introduced legislation which will uh, increase the energy efficiency of these houses starting from 2025, because obviously there's a lag in terms of when you start building these houses. So there's a lot of um, policy and that's, um, uh, that, that's being developed. The hydrogen um, uh, question is still uh, something that we need to address, partly because at the moment we do not produce um, cheap hydrogen, but sh- surely in the future when we do, we can actually legislate for houses that, that have to have or require potentially uh, hydrogen boilers. Uh, James, you worked on um, Hinkley Point C in the past. I- is your sense that nuclear is going to have to be part of any strategy to get to net zero by 2050? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've, we've got a, a large proportion of our electricity supply is already coming from, from, from nuclear generation. And a lot of those stations are going to be going offline during this decade. So we really need to get a plan to, to, to replace those. And as... Um, Banis Brown mentioned earlier, you know, to get to net zero, we're going to need to double, triple our electricity capacity, uh, you know, to, 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 make, to, to make it happen. And, um, you know, I think nuclear has some re- really sort of strong benefits, particularly as we know that that sort of ability to, you know, give predictable base load, low carbon power, and that's, you know, help contribute to the, the, the big drops in um, carbon intensity of, of, our, of our electricity system in, in, in the recent few years. And I think it's hard to see, uh, analysis where we don't have new nuclear in the mix that doesn't then sort of create additional problems, particularly sort of the, it would, I think, create an additional reliance on CCUS. And we know we're going to need a lot of that anyway. Um, and, you know, it comes back to this point that we, that we need all the technologies uh, at hand because they're, they're all going to play, play a part, whether that be nuclear uh, or CCUS, um, you know, for, for power and industry, but, you know, hydrogen, for example, in the, in the range of areas. So I think, you know, nuclear sort of remains sort of really key, you know, that there's great progress at Hinkley Point C um, currently in terms of the construction, you know, things that, you know, are, are sticking to time. Uh, you know, people were sort of, you know, have, have been critical of nuclear projects in, 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 in the past and in other places sort of overrunning. And I think a lot of lessons have been learned and they're being put into best practice at, at Hinkley. And uh, clearly there's now a need to, kind of, to replicate that um, because you know, it's, it's, I think it's it's no use of just doing a, a standalone project because then you don't kind of build on those those sort of uh, learnings both in terms of cost reduction but also industrial capabilities as well. You know, there are twenty five thousand construction jobs uh, involved with a project like that. And again, thinking around the, the priorities of a green recovery, if we can develop our nuclear capacity, both sort of large scale nuclear but also small modular reactors, which sort of feels like another great option for our power sector. But again, the kind of the from the industrial perspective, uh, both from from our skills side but also you know, from an expert Sport side as well looking forward so i think i think nuclear has to be a part of the solution uh keith you, you are a cop 26 business leader what do you think would be a realistic aim in terms of international commitments at that summit in glasgow next year do you think we could get kind of countries all around the world to agree to phase out coal for example oh yeah I, I yeah i think to me the trick with the trick with cop 26 is actually to try and shift some of the focus away from, from just being about international agreements and actually try and shift some of the focus away to being about success stories uh, and, and, and talking about success stories. Um, you know, and the conversation should be about here's the benefits of doing this and doing it well. So I, I, you know, I, I think the UK has got a fantastic story, uh, as have uh, you know, a number of other countries, about your know, don't don't go into this thinking tackling climate change is a big horrible messy expensive dreadful issue actually go into this understanding if you do this properly if you attack it in the right way if you put in the right processes and mechanisms actually tackling climate change not only is it beneficial from an environmental point of view economically it brings a huge boost to the country and that that to me is where we will get the greatest gain internationally, not not just so much in 
can we all agree to face call out by this day or that day? To me, the biggest gain and the biggest push we should keep making is showing people economically, here's what tackling climate change can bring in terms of benefits, in terms of jobs, manufacturing, traineeships, economic growth, uh, infrastructure, um, you know, building an economy, building new businesses, you know, new digital technologies. You, know, you get huge economic benefit from doing this and doing it well. If you look at all the stuff that's happened around offshore wind uh, and all of the investment that's coming on the back of it. And I think that's a, a, a much more positive way to go and approach this than just focus. I mean, I know that targets are, targets are important and international agreements are important, but the more we can do this and promote and show the idea about here's the benefit of doing this, not just from an environmental point of view, but from an economic point of view, to me, that will drive greater success than just doing it around trying to get targets. Baroness King, do you think that's the right approach to COP26? Uh, I certainly think that's a, that's a very important part of it. I think showing success stories is um, an enormously motivating way of getting people to think they want to do that. And, and I do also think the fact that, that global renewable energy spending is set to surpass oil and gas in 2021, some of the modelling that Cameron Hepburn and, and the team at Oxford have done, you know, showing that, that we could get to this tipping point in investment when the majority of investment is in renewables rather than fossil fuels. And suddenly investing in fossil fuels starts to feel a very insecure thing to do. And then we start really to accelerate that transition. And I think kind of demonstrating that kind of thing. So, you know, actually, in a way, sort of almost undermining the confidence of investing in, in fossil fuels and getting that tipping point in the investment system to come earlier is, is really key. Quasi, how would you define success for COP26? Um, I think targets are important. I mean, I took on board what Keith said, and I agree with him. But, you know, the, the whole nature of the international engagement is that we have these nationally defined contributions. And, you know, those inevitably involve targets. So we're going to have to agree, I think, uh, to a, a set of targets uh, that um, we are committed to as an international, as international players and part of the international community. Having said that, I think what Baroness Brown said about the investing uh, investment climate is really, really important um, because I think actually, uh, ultimately, if the private sector, private capital isn't signed up to this, we're not going to get anywhere near our targets. And the kind of, I think the technical term in finance or financial analysts use is derating. So that means that the multiple at which these um, fossil fuel companies trade it is going lower and lower because they're seen as being less secure investments. And I think that uh, Baroness Brown uh, has done very well actually to raise that because that's a huge part of this, of this picture. But in terms of COP26 specifically, I think there will be targets and there will be um, ambitious nationally, uh, national defined contributions. Uh, we're now going to move to your questions. Thank you very much for sending them in. Keep them coming. Uh, the first question comes from Chris, and I'm going to start with you, James. Uh, he basically says, what does government and business plan to do to bring rural off-grid users along on this journey? I think we've, we've picked up on, on one of the challenges around um, the um, development of our, of our grid networks and ensuring that the you know, electricity supply system um, uh, can deliver properly. And again, that comes back to the point around the need for sort of long-term investment and you know, the, the, the business government and uh, engagement with, with Ofgem as well. And, and Keith mentioned the, the, the recent sort of a draft determination on, on Rio2, which is obviously a, a, a point around sort of what, you know, how much can be invested by, by network companies. So we need to get that balance right. So we get that anticipatory investment and that's going to be key both for you know, electrification of, of heat and people's homes, but also you know, the need for for, for charging infrastructure for, for electric vehicles. Um, but, you know, I think we know it, we do need that kind of, you know, always a UK wide kind of you know, thought process when, when, when we, when we, when we kind of tackle these issues. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to be kind of urban centric and that's where a lot of our kind of problems are in terms of, I guess, sort of the, the numbers of people, but, you know, no one can be left behind. You know, it needs to be a just and fair transition. Um, and that needs to be both in terms of people's jobs, but also the cost of, of, of doing things. So I think, you know, from a, a both from a, a transport perspective um, and not, not forgetting sort of the role of public transport in, in, in rural areas as well and ensuring that that's really up to scratch. Because I think, you know, we all recognise that that 
that sort of been a uh, an area where you know we you know we, we've we've lost out on investment. So you know that that's you know, another area where, where I think we can bring in the the whole leveling up agenda to ensure that sort of rural communities you know are, are left behind in the transition. Uh, Kwasi, what, what, how, what, what do you think the government can do to make sure that this, this, this transition kind of works for everyone? Well, um, I think James made the point uh, just now. I think that the levelling up agenda, funnily enough, um, dovetails very nicely in with the decarbonisation agenda. Because if we look at where our old uh, and new, actually, industrial clusters are, if we see where the industrial carbon emissions are, very many of them, I mean, I'm thinking of uh, the Humber, I'm thinking of Teesside, I'm thinking of uh, the, the Mersey area. Many of these um, high uh, carbon intensive uh, industrial hubs um, were the site of um, you know, great amounts of industry over the last hundred years, but they are also uh, attracting investment for new technologies. We've talked about offshore wind, <coughs> Allstead are based um, just off uh, the Humber in the North Sea there. I see ITM Power, which is an electrolyzer for green, manufacturing green hydrogen. That's based in Sheffield. We've got the Teesside um, Development Council, the South Tees Development Council, which is very focused on clean energy and uh, renewable energy and, and new technologies. So um, it's just by accident, really, that uh, many of the areas where we need to, quote, unquote, level up are precisely the areas where um, deployment of capital and investment in new technologies um, can, 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 can best be made. Yeah. Uh, our next question, which I'd like to start with you, Baroness Brown, on is, is 2050 quick enough? A um, uh, question from someone saying that this needs to be done even faster than that. Do you, do you think 2050 is the first realistic date for this? I think we would all love to do this faster. But when you look at the, when you look at the scale of the challenge, um, we've got to between double and treble the size of the electricity industry. We've got to start a hydrogen industry almost from scratch and grow it to the size the electricity industry is today. Um, uh, we've got, to, um, we've got to, to move from having, you know, what is it, a few hundred thousand electric vehicles to having something like 30 million electric vehicles. We've got 30 million buildings which need to be converted to low carbon heat. We've got to, uh, we've got to make space for planting, you know, 30,000 to 50,000 hectares of trees, which means changing our farming practices uh, and indeed changing, you know, the way some of our farmers will earn their livelihoods. These are huge changes. And I think we've got to be realistic about, um, we're going to have to go very fast to get that done by 2050. I think that's doable. I'd love it to be earlier, but I think we do have to be realistic about the scale of change we've got to make. Akeep, um, what's your perspective and the perspective of industry? Do you mean, is, uh, you heard what Baroness Brown said there, you know, it, however nice it might be to be able to aim, to be aiming for 2045 or 2040, is 2050 really the most realistic time frame? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. I don't think we should worry too much about the, the, you know, the date and should we shift the date, should we move the date. Okay, we've got a date, we've got it in legislation. The UK you know, has taken a bold step in doing it and it's a fantastic thing to do. Uh, the fact that it's net zero is incredibly important because it avoids any jubility around what we're trying to achieve. So I, I, you know, I'm not that bothered about it. What, what I would say to you is if we, if we create the right frameworks, the right mechanisms, the right incentives, at the right marketplaces, we'll smash the target out of the water, okay? And, you know, we've got plenty of good, good examples of having done that. Do you, mean that? Do you mean by that we'll get there quicker? Well, I, th I think if, you're, if you look at each of the segments and, and you know, if, you, if you look at what's been done with offshore wind, you know, um, you know five, five, ten years ago, we kind of dreamt that we would try and get offshore wind below 100, at 100 pounds by 2020. We're sitting here in 2020 and projects are bidding in at 35 pounds we've annihilated the target because we've got the market right, we've got the investment right, we've got the innovation right, uh, and we've got the structure of the process and the framework correct. You, know, you look at what's going on with the EVs just now, we're 2040 and people were going, oh my God, 2040 is difficult. And now everybody's talking about 2035, 2030. Again, you know, the market, if you get the market set right, you get the investment right, 
we'll start banging these things out and, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. If we can do the same with heat, then it's fantastic, okay? Don't change the target, don't move the target. If we spend our life talking about whether the answer is 2050 or 2045, we'll miss the entire point of it. Um, leave the target out there, leave the date out there, and now let's just focus on the mechanisms that deliver against it and how we get there. And if you, you know, what we have shown time and time again in this country, you know, and this is a, a credit to the government and, and previous governments, you know, we are brilliant at inventing the right balance of regulatory and market process. We're great at bringing to bear some really, really good frameworks that incentivize investment and innovation. If we keep doing that, we'll do it, we'll deliver. Brilliant, thank you, Keith. James, um, when you look around the world, um, are there other countries in that we should be learning from in terms of policies in this area? I mean, you know, the, the UK, I think, has actually been a, a bit of a, a leader in ourselves, particularly from the, the, the policy perspective. Uh, you know, the frameworks that have been put in place that, you know, Keith was just describing that have delivered such, you know, you know at the time, sort of, um, you know, unbelievable falls in costs. I think those are things that other countries, you know, are learning uh, about from us. Um, so I think there's a lot that, that we can be proud of. Um, and again, I think this, the moment that we're at now, um, as a lot of other countries are now thinking about, you know, how they can use the green recovery to also sort of, uh, you know, move forward from the pandemic. There's the moment when, you know, we, we need to look at this, uh, you know, we, we can't lose out on our international leadership here. So we need to kind of keep that, that pace of innovation in terms of our policy ideas. And, you know, um, the, you know, the, the call then to government to, to keep being bold uh, around its decision making um, uh, you know, and, and making decisions that are also sort of timely and again sort of through the strategies that we, we've heard about um, that that needs to happen so that we, we can keep pace you know we, we've seen some um, you know large-scale um, investment announcements from you know the, the French and, and German governments in, in hydrogen particularly which have sort of been well documented so you know, those are examples of how sort of the I guess the competition is trying to sort of um, sort of catch up or, or overtake but I think you know from a, a policy perspective you know we've got a, a lot to um, to be proud of, but you know, let, you know, there are some some, some areas that where, where we can learn. I think, you know, I think you know, looking at low carbon heat, for example, other countries that uh, sort of have a similar kind of profiles to us, like the Netherlands, for example, who also have a, a strong reliance on, on natural gas. I think they've made more progress when it comes to um, sort of decarbonizing their heat system. So there, so that's just one example of, I guess, when we you know we can can, can look abroad to get some uh, insights. But you know, we should be proud of what we've done and, and sort of the uh, you know, the innovative, innovative thinking that we've done from a policy perspective here. Thank you, James. Quasi, uh, uh, I think the Emmanuel Macron's talked about spending kind of 4% of French GDP on green measures. Angela Merkel's talked about, I think, about 6% of German GDP. Um, do you think we need that kind of cash investment to, to maintain our current position internationally in this area? Well, I mean, I hate to be nitpicking, but the, the announcements they made were part of a general economic recovery. Yes, they put the green bit, if you like, at the centre of that. But the 4% of GDP, the 2% of GDP, you're talking about 130 billion euros. Um, you know, we, we've committed to spending, I think, at least as much as that, if not more, um, across the economy. And we've also said very specifically that the green recovery will be at the centre of that. So while not all the spending is necessarily focused uh, on the green recovery, the green recovery is at the centre uh, and the most important element uh, in terms of the spending. Uh, Baroness Brown, you used to be on, on the, um, the non, one of the non-executive directors of the Green Investment Bank. Do, do you think that the UK needs another iteration of that to kind of further push forward uh, this agenda? Yes, I'm a, I'm a big fan of that as a, as a mechanism. Uh, I think the, uh, the Green Investment Bank did a brilliant job um, in the offshore wind area of moving offshore wind from being seen as a a high risk investment to being seen as as an investment that every pension fund wanted to have part of that it was you know you could be really confident in it and and it moved not only the operating wind farms to being an, an investment that people could be confident in it actually moved um development of wind farms to being an investment people could be confident in which of course brought down the cost of investment which was a big chunk in the early days 
of the reduction in costs in the costs of offshore wind. I mean, clearly there have been huge technology developments and much, much bigger turbines that have been part of that story as well. But the cost of money was also a big chunk. And I think the Green Investment Bank did a, a really good job of, of demonstrating that the government, because it was putting it was it was putting government's money alongside other drawing in other investments money of, of saying the government genuinely believes in this and is going to stick with it. It is the long term policy. This is something uh, that you can and it, that you can put your money into and de-risk it that way. And I think there are so many other areas like hydrogen, like carbon capture and storage, um, where an approach and some of the other technologies we're going to need where an approach like that, I think, would be very helpful. Um, and I know discussions have been going on and I know um, Lord Stern has been uh, lobbying and I've heard Quasi mention these things. So I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, that we might be seeing something like that coming forward. Uh, Keith, from an, from an industry perspective, is that something you would welcome? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, I, you know, I think you know, everything to me is going in the right direction. And I think you know, we're, we're, we've got great stuff going on in the country, a great focus on this in the country. Uh, great policies in the country, uh, a, a huge willingness to invest uh, in the future of this, and you know it's it's um, we just need to you know just to trigger the right actions now and get everything shifting and everything moving in the right direction. And I think yeah, um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I think we're we're in a good place and we've got a, a huge opportunity uh, ahead of us. And I think this is um, you know I, th I think we should be really positive. And um. We're running up towards the end of our hour. I thought what I might just do is ask everyone to give me, to give us, a, I don't think you've got time for more than a minute or so of, of closing thoughts on, on the best way to do it. So I'll reverse the order from earlier. So James, do you want to give your kind of minute on what you think would most help business and industry get to this net zero target by 2050? Yeah, I think for me, it's, it's pretty clear that between now and COP26, we want to get a, a really sort of strong set of uh, policy roadmaps in place um, to kind of really kind of map out the trajectory for, uh, for, for, for different sectors and particularly um, next steps for the, for the energy market and the energy white paper we've mentioned, the decarbonisation of transport plan, our, our heating buildings. Um, I, you know, I'm, re I'm really going to set that out clearly so you know the businesses sort of know kind of the context they're going to be operating in but you know let's not be held back by creating sort of the, the perfect framework at this sense you know we need, we can keep options open they don't need to be sort of final decisions but you know just sort of get things moving and I think you know now is such a brilliant opportunity to, to do that and by COP26 if we've done it then that's going to be one of the elements of success and is going to help us sort of get lots of other countries sort of matching our ambition level. Quasi, what are your final Yeah, thoughts? I mean, look, I think uh, what uh, both um, Julia and Keith Anderson said just now um, really captures what we're trying to do. I think uh, with regard to the Green Investment Bank, I think it did a great job in its time of uh, wedding together uh, private and public uh, capital. That's the only way we're going to get to where we need to get to is, is a combination of both. The private sector can't do it on its own and the and the public sector can't do it uh, on its own. Um, the other thing that I would suggest is that um, in, in line with uh, what James has just said, um, I think that uh, the policy framework is pretty robust. I think we have shown some leadership. There's clearly a long way to go. Uh, and there are difficult, hard to abate sectors like uh, how homes and buildings. We mentioned one or two of them today. But I think the broad direction, as Keith said, is, is in a good place. And I just hope we can renew our energy and increase our efforts, but we're certainly going in the right direction on this. Uh, Keith, what are your final closing thoughts for us? Yeah, I just think uh, we, we should go into this now with, uh, with the mindset that there are, there are really very few regrets in anything we do. So, you know, if we accelerate investment, if we advance investment, if we do stuff quickly, if we shift quickly, if we use existing technology, there's very little in any of that that we could regret so I think there are very few risks around stranded assets or lost investment or missed opportunity. So we, we can move quickly. We can do stuff quickly. Um, there's so much to do. Uh, the faster we move, the better. So we just get, uh, we, um, you know, we've historically shown it, we get the best mix between regulatory frameworks, market frameworks, government and government incentive and, and, and government input to it as well. And you know, we, we can go quickly and we can move quickly and we just, we just need to start moving now. 
Thank you, Keith. Baroness Brown, the last word to you. I, well, I agree with all the things that have, have been said. Um, I, I'd also like to say that I think, um, as Keith has said, we've got all the technologies that we need for the next 10 to 15 years of, of rapid progress. Uh, but I, I do hope, despite the, the um, challenging financial con situation we're in, that, that we will still be able to really invest and up our investment in science and innovation because we do still need those new innovations for the last 10 years and the world doesn't end at 2050. The challenges go on beyond. So I think alongside all of this, we need that, that up of, upping of our, our ambition in the science and innovation area to help us uh, be real leaders for the future. Well, I think with this Downing Street, you, you, you won't have any difficulty in getting more funding for science and research. Um, all that is left to do is for me to thank the panel for having an absolutely fascinating and fantastic discussion. I think mean, so often when you host these, these fringe events at, at party conference, you come away from the discussion meeting rather downbeat because it's about some problem that we don't appear to have any uh, ability to solve. But I thought today was very different and a very positive discussion about something where, we, where this country seems to be making real progress and, and, and has a great claim to be a global leader. So really all, all that's left for me to do, I'd normally ask the audience to clap, but seeing as they're all sitting at home, they're probably all on mute. Um, but all I can do is say, thank you all so much for uh, your thoughts today. Thank you all at home for tuning in. And uh, there is an event with Joe Johnson later on this afternoon on universities. Uh, and then an event uh, uh, later on this evening about the magic money tree and how much the government can keep spending. But thank you to my panel today. Absolutely excellent discussion. And thank you for tuning in.